Hey friends, Karen Pennington here. And for some reason this morning, I'm thinking about vending machines, uh, about the love-hate relationship I've had with them over the years. Vending machines, when I was a teenager, were like this magical, beautiful thing. It had all the food I wanted <laughs> right at my fingertips, not usually that expensive. The only problem would be if the dollar bill I had was too crinkled to get in there. But I mean, come on. Caffeine, salt, sugar, fat, those are like the four basic food groups for a teenager, right? And they were right there. They were always, you know, somewhere easy to access. I can remember, you know, being hotels, not hotels, and hospitals. And back then I didn't really want healthy food, so I would rather have a candy bar if we were stuck in the ER because someone broke their finger or something, you know, so I would, and I loved the soda and I just, it, it was, whoa, and exactly when you wanted something, you got it, right? So you, you just inserted the money, chose what you wanted, and out came what you wanted exactly then, except for when things got stuck. That was horrible, especially if you're really hungry, but I'll tell you, lately, I want to say I hate vending machines. There are sometimes healthy options, but more likely than not, even in the hospital, it's hard to find the healthiest option in the vending machine itself. It is, um, sometimes they do a little better than others. Trail mix isn't too bad, unless you, like me, have issues with not wanting to have too much salt, you know. Um, there, there are other things that aren't too bad, but a lot of times you still have the, the, the Doritos, the things that keep really well because they've had all those preservatives in them. So now, you know, if I honestly, we live a mile from our local hospital. So if I'm at an ER or someone's at an ER and I'm hungry, we'll just go home and grab an apple. It's probably cheaper than figuring out where the vending machine is or how to get it out or where. But um, they're more convenient now than they've ever been because now instead of using dollar bills, you can use the little uh, credit cards. Evidently, I'm short on words this morning, but... Yeah, I was just thinking about vending machines and uh, somehow in my brain this morning, I'm connecting Christmas with vending machines. Here's how, not everywhere, I'm not saying everyone's like this, but a lot of times in the U.S., one of the things that children like about Christmas, maybe even grownups, is that, let's be honest, on Christmas morning, we're going to get something we want. We know it's coming. We know we're going to get what we want. I remember the, the Christmas story. I'm thinking about this, that movie, The Christmas Story, where the kid wants the BB gun. And all the way through, it's like, you'll shoot your eye out. You'll shoot your eye out. You'll shoot your eye out. And eventually, Christmas morning, ta-da, he got what he wanted. And then he hurt something. <laughs> he hurt him. So he got what he wanted. Maybe not what have been the best thing, not what he needed, but he got what he wanted. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with BB guns all the time. That's not a commentary, but it's it's interesting that it was it was purely in so many ways we get attached to this. Oh, I'm getting what I want exactly when I was planning to get it. Vending machines. I'm going to make a choice. It's going to come out. I'm going to get right now what I want because I don't, you know, when we're waiting for somebody to be admitted to the hospital, when we're stressed out, I can't drive a half a mile or a mile to get something I need or to get something that's good for me. And, and honestly, some of those foods now in the vending machine, it's not so much that I don't like the taste of them. It's that they back, I'm getting old and I have an older stomach and they backfire and the, you know, hours of agony and indigestion and just feeling nasty do not counterway that feeling of biting into a Dorito that once. Not that I never eat Doritos. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying... If we are constantly, constantly on this vending machine mentality where we wait until we're too hungry, we don't fill ourselves with good things, and then we want exactly what's in front of us right when we want it, um, that's not, it's not really that healthy. Uh, some of us can survive it better than others. Some of us have been blessed with better metabolisms than I have. But uh, I'm thinking about well, what do we teach our kids on Christmas? And uh, man, it's kind of getting a little uh, heavy here, yeah, but uh, we teach our children, some of us do, that if we're really good and we tell the jolly guy in a red suit what we want, then on Christmas morning, we're going to get it. 
if we behave, if we're good, if we request it the right way, then we're going to get exactly what we think we want, exactly when we want it. Um, I personally struggle with this a little bit. I always have. I, I don't mind legends. I don't mind red hats, anything like that. But the idea that be good, that getting gifts is about us being good. Now, there's a, there is a thing there. They call it the Protestant work ethic where if you work hard, you can work towards your goals and reach your goals. That's okay. But um, it makes me sad on Christmas that it's about getting gifts is about being good. Um, first of all, because there are people that don't make a lot of money, but who are really good and they don't get to, to have that. And then there are people that make a lot of money and don't behave and they get a lot of what they you know want. There's that. And also I'm, I'm just that Santa Claus mentality, the Santa brain at Christmas that says behave a little bit than just tell this person that you've never met what you want and then you'll get it and you'll get it good um, and you'll get it exactly the way you asked for it exactly the way you want it you don't have to, and there's no consultation with Santa Claus to Santa what do you think I want what do you think I need what do you it's just Santa I saw this thing on television and I want it so give it to me and um, that Santa brain it's I, I don't know that that's really has anything to do with what Christmas is really about. Gifts are great. The idea of gifts that are undeserved are great. Um, the idea of, you know, historically St. Nicholas, there was this amount of grace where people couldn't afford things, but they got them anyways, and they were what they needed. You know, putting, put gold coins in the socks, you know, stockings. Um, that's beautiful. I wish we would share more of that. But uh, Christmas... We got exactly what we needed, you know, when Jesus was born. It wasn't exactly when we asked for it, and it wasn't exactly how we asked for it. And the outplay of the gift lasted a while. And so when I'm talking about Santa brain, I'm talking about our vending machine mentality of, I see something in front of me, I think I want it, I insert my prayer or my wish, and then it comes out exactly when I expect it will. And that's joy, you know, that's good. But hope is so much deeper than that. Hope is a vine mentality, not a Santa mentality. Um, who, I mean, to me, when I think of Christmas, I do think of hope, which is not, oh, I hope this vending machine works and it comes out right away. Uh, there's something deeper than that. I want to um, want to read a pretty, pretty popular passage. This is John 15, the vine mentality. Um, and it's verses 1 through 11. I am the vine, tr I'm the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You've already been cleansed, but that word I've spoken to you, by the word I've spoken to you, abide in me and I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit on itself by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. You hear how much abides coming out? I believe 10 times over 11 verses. I'm the vine, you are the branches. He said it again. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Huh. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, I love this. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. If you abide in me and I abide in you and my words and abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Is that the Santa mentality? Nope. Still a vine mentality. I'll tell, talk about why in a second. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So there is an element here. It says, if you ask whatever you wish, it's going to be done for you. However, that other word, he says over and over and over again, abide, 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 
abide. And there's two things I want to say about that. First of all, abide means to remain, to stay, to wait, continue. If God gave us exactly what we thought we wanted, exactly when we asked for it, exactly in that timing, then we wouldn't have to abide. And that, the tense, is something called aorist tense. Sometimes we think of it as past tense. In Greek, this is the original Greek word this is written in. It basically means something that doesn't get completed. It, this is an ongoing process. There is a process of remaining in God. Um, and let's think about it. He wouldn't have to tell us to remain if it was easy. He wouldn't have to tell us to remain if it was automatic. If we didn't have to think about remaining, he wouldn't tell us. This. There, this, he's saying make an active choice to stay in my word, to stay in my grace. He said words. Not just hear the words, but receive what he's saying. When we're seeking after God, Jeremiah uh, 29, 13 says, you, um, you'll seek me and find me and you seek me with all your heart. Um, so is this about getting what we want? Absolutely. Is it about getting what we want because of the words of Christ who is a vine? Absolutely. Is this a Santa mentality? No. See, we live in a culture where we can order it on Amazon and it comes right to our door. We don't even have to go after it. We, can, we don't have to walk in to a fast food place to get food. We just drive through. Um, I had a friend from another country come oh, about 10, 20 years back that went, holy moly, you even have drive through ATMs. You can't get out of the car and walk three feet? That's really lazy. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. And the funny thing is it takes longer to go through the drive through sometimes than if you were to just step out and walk up to the ATM. But... Uh, no, this is about more than that. This is about fruit. This is about sowing. And here's something else that really gets to me. And he removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. There's that abide. Um, there's, there was a show I started to watch and quickly fit, stopped that had this verse, all things work together for good. That's the first half of Romans 28, but it's all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Um, if we're constantly doing the opposite of what God tells us to do, constantly, constantly going the opposite direction, how do we expect that there's goodness in that? If we walk and step off a cliff just because we want to, why would we expect that it's God's job to save us. God's telling us how to be saved. God's telling us the way to go. And because God's a gentleman, he allows us to make that choice to go in the right direction or not. When we're not going in the right direction and we feel cut off, that's not God's fault. But sometimes, what about those times when we're going in the right direction and there is, there are issues, there are struggles. And to this, I would say, John 15, 2, second half of that, Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear, bear more fruit. And that word pruning is actually the word for cleansing as well. You know what pruning is when you cut off parts. Pruning hurts. So there may be some of us today who are, I've been thinking about this a lot because I have a lot of friends who are going through really, really hard struggles and they're so genuinely faithful and I don't believe it's a punishment from God. I do believe it's pruning. Uh <clears throat> When you're faithful, sometimes you go through these times where God tries to burn off the other stuff in you, um, where God allows you to go through something that's painful because that's what's necessary to grow. When you prune, you cut off the things that are not fruitful, that are keeping you from growth or, or cleaning. You cut off the dirt, you cut off the nastiness, you cut off the decay so that you can further grow. Like when you're cutting your hair, people don't want to cut their hair. I never do, but that's just because... I never remember, but you cut off the dead ends, not so that your hair will go shorter, but you, by cutting off, you know, a quarter of an inch or half an inch, you're able to grow more for, further. So maybe some of us are going through something right now and it feels like a punishment from God. And maybe, I mean, in pruning, it does bring up the bad stuff too, but maybe it's not a punishment from God. Even if you don't know the Lord and you're going through something difficult, maybe it's not a punishment from God. God does discipline. Sometimes there are consequences that have nothing to do with God. They have to do with the fact that we did whatever we wanted and now we are getting the results of it. But sometimes, a lot of times when we're going through hard things, it's God's way of calling us. Like God may not even cause it, but he'll allow it to cause us back to him, 
to call us back to him. You know, I'm thinking of the vine and the branches and I'm thinking of when we ask for the things that we really, really want. First of all, he says, if my, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for me whatever you want. That doesn't mean you open up a catalog, see something that looks good and order on Amazon. That's, that's not it. When we rely on God, when we stay in God, when we seek after God, the first thing God does is show us what we want. Show us. He doesn't just always give us what we want. He shows us what we want. He connects our heart with his so we start to want the right things. And we want them enough that we'll abide. We'll wait past Christmas. There is an element of hope in Christmas in that you're confidently expecting that you're going to get something good on Christmas morning. Uh, but that... I'm not totally anti that, but that thing, the Santa brain where you're like, all right, no relationship with this external dude. I'm just going to go through a different party and say what I want. Um, that's, we have something so much better than that. We have something so much better than that. We have a personal relationship. We have somebody who's called to intimacy. I mean, you're part of the same branch. Your veins are connected together. If you're part of this vine, God is not calling us to a Santa brain mentality. He's not calling us to, okay, you do this, 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 and this, and you tell me what you want, and you'll get it back on this day the way you want it. And let's think a little bit more about the idea of pruning. The things that are most worth having often take a process to go through. If you're asking God to have a good marriage and a loving relationship, and then you face trials together, you're getting what you asked for because... It is in the trials, it's in the struggles that you grow deeper together, that you learn to trust God, that you learn to trust each other. If you're asking God to help you learn and then you get in a really hard class with a really tough teacher, you're getting what you wanted because that teacher is going to challenge you to move beyond what you want. So not everything that's hard is a punishment. Many things that aren't hard are a punishment. A lot of them are pruning. A lot of them are cleaning. A lot of them are preparing. So this morning, my challenge to myself and to you is to say thank you, even for the hard stuff, to say thank you in everything because even the hard stuff, even the hard stuff, doesn't matter whether or not God caused it. A lot of times God didn't. Maybe sometimes God did. But God will use it. God will work it together. Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for the good of those who love him. Lord, this morning I thank you for the pruning. It's a hard thing to thank you for, but it's necessary, God. Thank you for allowing us to go through hard times and then being with us through it. Lord, help us to have the faith have the intelligence, have the wisdom to just stick with you through it, Lord. Not that we don't have to, not that we can't be honest. Uh, God, I don't want a vending machine faith. I don't want a faith that inserts wishes and expects certain results. I want to be connected to you. I want intimacy. The Emmanuel, the fact that you came to earth meant that you came to be one of us so that you could be with us. And you could understand us, God, and be with us today. Help us to just look at the things that are hard in our lives and see them as a reason, a reason to praise you, a reason to thank you for pruning, a reason to remain in you in the understanding that as we seek you, you will show us our own hearts and we will be filled, Lord Jesus. And we trust you to give us everything we need and ultimately everything we want when we remain in you. In your name, amen. Be blessed, my friends.